to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm recording this on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome you to another healthy bite. My name is Dr. Ryan. Now this week uh, we spoke to Tim Silverwood, an environmental activist, an entrepreneur, his company, Ocean, Ocean Impact Organisation, is uh, really um, making a difference. It's uh, encouraging industries to, to find solutions to the environmental problems that we have. And I think it was a, a really important uh, podcast, a really important subject. I mean, Tim raised some rather disturbing statistics that here in Australia we consume something like 100 kilos per person per year of plastics, which invariably find their way into the ocean. And only 13% of those plastics that we consume are recycled. And his organisation is certainly working hard to ensure that number goes up significantly. And even more disturbingly, I guess, is the fact that 300 million, 350 million tonnes of plastic is added to our environment each year. And so I would encourage you to have a listen to it. But <clears throat> I also thought I would share with you this um, article that came out almost in the same week that I spoke to... Well, it was in the same week that I spoke to Tim, so this seemed like an excellent thing to draw your attention to as well. And the article came out in the Weekly Guardian and it was entitled The Plastosphere. If that's a term you're not familiar with, you will be in a moment. New life forms born of garbage. The plastics we allow to pollute our oceans have given rise to a warped ecosystem of novel specialised organisms. Now, it rather makes a few rather sobering um, points. Plastic bottles dominate waste in the ocean, with an estimated one million of them reaching the sea every minute. One million every minute. And the biggest culprit is polyethylene terephthalates. We may know them better as PET bottles. So when you go in to a shop and ask for a bottle of water, um, then that is a PET bottle that you are using. Um, it goes on to say, like the atmosphere, the magnetosphere, the hydrosphere, the, plastis, the plastisphere is a region, but it's also an ecosystem. And like the Siberian steppe or coral reef, a plasticized marine environment, the best, it's a plasticized marine environment. The best known concentration of seaborne plastic waste is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch a sort of plastic soup spread over an area roughly twice the size of France. But really, plastic is everywhere. And I, we actually did speak to uh, Tim about his experience. He went on a 5,000-kilometre 5, journey to witness firsthand the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And um, I won't spoil that for you. He gave a very interesting insight. But I think the key here is that plastic is everywhere. And while we are encouraged to eat seafood as a healthy, um, healthy choice, I have always, certainly over the last five or ten years, had serious concerns about um, uh, seafood as a choice for two reasons. One, the sustainability issue. We have literally raped and pillaged the sea, so now there are as there, there are just dead patches within vast uh, areas of ocean. And you only have to look at the way um, fishing is conducted, where two big trawlers will drop nets that might be actually kilometres apart. And those nets just literally vacuum up the ocean floor, collecting fish large and small uh, with commercial value or no commercial value. Uh, that is sorted. Perhaps stuff is thrown back. Perhaps the, um, the stuff that doesn't have commercial value is then ground up as what's called bi-kill and then served as part, part of the diet to farmed fish. And if farmed fish you think is an alternative, you probably we might have a podcast uh, 
uh, soon with uh, people who have worked in that industry. And I don't think it's a very pretty picture, and I certainly am not reassured by farmed fish as an alternative, in the same way that I don't like industrial animal agriculture. You know, animals that are kept unnaturally in their pens and uh, their waste, which is actually an amazing resource for nature, actually becomes a toxic problem, which needs uh, chemical interventions to protect the species from infection, as in antibiotic use, which is what is our biggest exposure is antibiotic use in our animal agricultural industry, and also the use of other additives to provide um, uh, necessary colour. So uh, this is a problem, one of, well, I digress there. The first problem with seafood is one of sustainability. We have literally stripped the ocean of life. The second problem is one of toxicity, and I've always felt that large fish were a no-go area for me because I was, for many years, for the last 30 or so, or 40 years, preoccupied with mercury toxicity, which I still am to this day, and so I would always avoid larger fish, like tuna and kingfish, you know, those fish that are further up the, um, the food chain in the ocean because they concentrate the mercury into their into their um, bodies and therefore onto my plate uh, but now it seems that uh, seafood large and small um, are, are are affected by plastic and the, the study Tim referred to is um, that we consume five grams of plastic a day in one form or another um, whether we open a bag of chips whether we are near a road where the brakes the brake linings of cars, uh, plastic and uh, or rubber and that is a derivative from the the fossil fuel industry and we inhale that and that same study said something like we consume a credit card of ca of plastic uh, whether I think it was uh, a week a month or even if it was for a year um, I, I don't want to be consuming a credit card a bit of plastic ever in my life let alone over a year but that is what the studies are showing we are actually consuming. And so um, this is a real problem. And uh, plastics, of course, are produced by the uh, fossil fuel industry, which, as fossil fuels are losing their flavour, uh, the, the industry has, over the last 30 or 40 years, pivoted very significantly to uh, produce plastics, and they are literally everywhere. And I digress for a moment, but I think I, would, I also would like to draw your attention to the fact that the International Monetary Fund has done a study in over the last five or more years. And um, when I first became aware of the study in 2015 or 16, and it hasn't changed to any appreciable degree, um, they estimated that the fossil fuel industry receive in government and other subsidies um, something like five trillion US dollars a year. Now that's a hard figure to get your head around, so let me put it into a more realistic perspective. That is 10 million US dollars a minute. So this uh, healthy bite may go for five or 10 minutes, and during that time, the fossil fuel industry globally has received something like 50 to 100 trillion uh, million dollars, 50 to 100 million dollars of subsidies. Now that five trillion US dollars a year subsidy is more than all the health budgets of all the countries combined. So just get your head around that one and, um, and, and realize that this isn't just about carbon dioxide in the environment from fossil fuels being burnt, but the fossil fuel industry also is responsible for the plastics. One can only imagine why we don't nationalise them all and close them all down, but hey, I'm not in charge of the government, um, or governments for that matter. Uh, but anyway, uh, if we take the definition of an ecosystem as a biological community interacting, of or interacting organisms and their physical environment, then this is almost certainly true of the plastosphere. Um, the... Uh, Another unique feature of the plastosphere is that it is humans that invented it, unlike the other ecosystems that have evolved literally over millions of years. Now, the meaning of that is not clear. I can only assume that it's not going to be a very positive 
uh, thing that we have uh, uh, developed this wonderful, or this, not wonderful, but this um, ecosystem called the plastosphere. And uh, one thing is for sure, the Earth will definitely survive irrespective of the environmental uh, challenges we as a species put to it. And perhaps our time on this Earth is uh, just a, a short blip, but I'm an, I'm an optimist and I believe in human ingenuity and our ability to turn these things around. However, there is another article in this same journal which I thought I would share with you. Now this article entitled, Why is life on Earth still taking second place to fossil fuel companies? And it is written by one of my favourite uh, journalists, George Monbiot. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but I, I, whatever he writes resonates, seems to resonate with me. And uh, let me just share with you some of the highlights here of this article. The human, George, this is George Monibot, Monbiot saying, the human tragedy is that there is no connection with, with what, between what we know and what we do. Almost everyone is now at least vaguely aware that we face the greatest catastrophe our species has ever confronted. Yet, scarcely anyone alters their behaviour in response to it. So I mentioned to you about fossil fuel subsidies. Let me give you another perspective. An analysis by the cons conservation charity, the World Wildlife Fund, suggests that while the last UK budget allocated $198 million dollars, uh, this is the Australian Guardian, so they've converted it into dollars, for environmental measures, it dedicated $55 billion, uh, $55 billion to policies that will increase emissions. Unless we leave, leave fossil fuels in the ground, any commitment to stop climate breakdown is merely gestural. And that commitment of $198 million to environmental measures while dedicating $55 billion to policies which will increase uh, emissions is a good example of, of that. Are you and it actually goes even further. This is how insidious or how powerful, one might say, the uh, fossil fuel industry is. And, uh, and I would have to add to this, apart from this journal and maybe others too, but um, the media are complicit in, in not bringing this to our attention each and every day. Another example he draws on. A UK oil company is currently suing the Italian government for the loss of its future anticipated profits after Italy banned new oil drilling in coastal waters. Italy used to be a signatory of the Energy Charter Treaty, which allows companies to demand compensation if it stops future projects. So how's that for something that built the built-in? Governments still fear lobby groups more than they fear the collapse of our living systems. No government, even the most progressive, is yet prepared to contemplate the transformation we need, a global program that places survival of humanity and the rest of, the Earth, of life on Earth above all other images. We don't just need new policies, but new ethics. We need to close the gap between knowing and doing. But this conversation has scarcely begun. Well, <clears throat> that's partly what this podcast is all about. And wouldn't it be great if this message got out to a few million people every week? But I refer now to one of my favourite episodes with Alan Savory, which I refer back to you often. And he is a world leader in holistic management. And he says all things need to... Every decision made by governments, companies, local authorities, organisations, individuals need to have a holistic context. Something over the top of every decision that is made which drives and informs their decision. And that holistic context perhaps could be why is life on Earth still taking second place to fossil fuel companies? Why not make the holistic context that life on Earth, be it the health of the individual and the health of the planet, because they're, they are inseparable, are the major uh, driver, the major ethic that everything um, 
all future policies are made from that point on. So I, I thought I would just share with you some of those thoughts and some of those really great articles that came out in the same week that I had the pleasure of talking to Tim Silverwood. I think he and, his, and the organisation that he's doing is, is doing a terrific job. In that same week, I also had the pleasure, which I always enjoy, of talking to another environmental activist and, and, and a wonderful author, Sarah Wilson. And that episode will be is out as well. Will be out as well. And she talks a lot about this uh, existential threat which we all face and all need to do something about. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.